message live. To make sure that you don't miss anything we're doing, like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, make sure that you turn on notifications. You don't want to miss a thing. Welcome to Message Live and our series Made in Manchester. Uh, we're here right in the heart of Manchester and in this city we have a great spirit of unity amongst the Christian leaders and some amazing communicators like Paul Lloyd. Paul Lloyd helps to lead Victory Outreach which is a truly precious ministry that reaches out to people on the margins, people struggling with addiction and sees some incredible outcomes. And Paul's going to teach us how to transform our outcomes. Imagine by watching this talk if your outcomes could be transformed for the better. Yes, it can happen. Get your notepad out, share the good news about this brilliant talk and watch this now from Paul Lloyd. Galatians chapter 6, I'm going to be reading from verse Four. And the title of this message today is a continuation of our transformation series. And today's message is entitled, Transforming Your Outcomes. Transforming Your Outcomes. And in Galatians, it starts off like this in verse 4. Paul's right into the church in Galatia and he says this. He says, pay careful attention to your own work. For then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. Ouch. How many of you fall into the comparison trap? Because you, un you have to understand that the enemy of contentment is comparison. You know, you have a nice pair of shoes, your hair's looking good, your teeth are looking not as brown as they were, hello. You know, you might have lost a few pounds, but then you compare yourself to someone else and all of a sudden your contentment goes out the window because of comparison. But Paul's been very clear. He says, pay attention to yourself, your own work. Don't worry about someone else. Don't compare yourself in either your achievements or your failures with anyone else. You are your biggest work. You say, we're our biggest enemy. I mean, if you, you know that you're your biggest enemy, right? You're trying to lose weight the food in the fridge calls you, or that little cheeky cupboard that you keep with all your goodies in it. You know, the next thing, the chocolate is overwhelmed, everything else, etc., etc. So he's very clear. And then he says, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Sometimes we want to blame everyone else, right? It's everyone else's fault. No, it's not. You're responsible for your own conduct. Those who are taught the Word of God should provide for their teachers. I like this bit. Sharing all good things with them. Thus says the Apostle Paul and the Word of God. Amen. I like that bit. The problem is most people just share their problems with me. Huh? That's all right. Then it says this. It's very clear. It's very, this is key. Open up your heart and your ears right now. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. That's key. You will always harvest what you plant. Remember that. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, God's time, the right time, not your time or my time, the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. You know how many people give up before they get the blessing? You know, we talk a little bit about that in the relationship thing that's coming up. You know, I thank God that I didn't give up before I got the blessing of my wife. Because I got Miss Right. I know many people that get mistake. Hello? Mischievous, misdemeanor. And then they miss everything that God wants for their lives. Huh? Do not give up, don't quit, don't stop, don't keep pressing forward. 
don't keep doing the right thing because it's going to bear fruit. There's going to be a result of it. There's going to be a consequence to that. You don't need two brains to work this stuff out, man. The Bible is there. It's clear. Everything else has come from that. Every bit of truth has come from the Word of God. And it's understandable, right? Huh? And then he's, he finishes with this. He says, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. So today, I want to look at transforming your outcomes. We're going to look at three things. We're going to look at, number one, what is an outcome? What does it mean, this word outcomes? Not something that you use a lot. Number two, how can outcomes affect our lives? And then number three, what can you do to change them? That's the important thing, right? What can you do to change your outcomes? So first of all, an outcome, what is it? Well, it can be described as the way a thing turns out. It's an outcome. It's the way something turns out. It's a consequence. The result of an action. And there are many things that are taking place in people's lives here today. Even watching on the screen, there are many things taking place in your life today that are the results or consequences of actions. Things that we've done or said or things, even things that we haven't done or said that maybe we should have done or said. But there are consequences and we're living them out. How many of you have realised that some of the things that you're going through are a consequence of something that you did or didn't do? We don't get out of these things scot-free. There's always a result. There's always an outcome. Huh? The key question when you're looking at an outcome though is what do I really want? There's a lot of people that just have accidental outcomes because they don't know what they really want and then they just end up bumbling around and then they, they, they end up in a result of something that they don't really want but they never put anything in in the first place so they've ended up with an accidental outcome, a result or a consequence and they're not happy with it. Hello? Huh? What do I really want? See, these then are your aims. And from them, you'll get goals. You'll set goals. And you, you, you're going to get these aims and goals, whether they're accidental or intentional. You're going to reach somewhere at some time. The key thing is to get there on purpose. I mean, if you've ever gone on a journey and got lost because you didn't know the direction. <laughs> huh? It's like I was talking to my, to my daughter Lily today on the way, you know, and I was explaining this to her about outcomes. I said, it's like, well, I've got a sat-nav in my car. It sits right there, right? It's part of the car. I said, these outcomes, it's like having a sat-nav in your car and saying you want to go somewhere and they're not putting in a destination. I said, then any route will take you wherever it is and you'll end up anywhere. But if you want to get somewhere, you're intentional about it and you'll set the aim, you'll set the direction. You'll put in where you want to go. And then you follow the instruction and it's an intentional thing and you'll end up getting to where you want to go. But there's a lot of people end up in a place as a drug addict, messed up, with a, in an unloving marriage, in a job they hate. Come on now. Fat instead of fit. And they're like, they wake up and how did I get here? Well, you did it because you didn't have the right aims or goals. You ended up living your life unintentionally by accident and you've ended up in a life that is now looking like an accident. Huh? You look in the mirror and you look like an accident. You're like, what has happened there, man? Look like I've been in an accident. Amen? Because sometimes we don't realise that our aims are not godly ones. Sometimes we have ungodly aims. Huh? Which is why our outcomes then become full of pain and fear and emptiness. And this is a biggie. And in the New Testament, James the half-brother of Jesus puts it like this in James 4, verses 1 through 3. He says, What is causing the quarrels and fights amongst you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. And that means, you know, when we want what, what, what only gives us pleasure, it's always for an immediate thing. You know how that, that is how mass mind control te te techniques take place? Huh? 
I was watching telly uh, yesterday, TV yesterday, and I was watching what was happening in Zimbabwe. We have some Zimbabweans in the house. And that was lightweight. We have, that was your cue, man, to represent. If I said we have some Nigerians in the house, we have some Jamaicans in the house, we have some Scottish in the house, we have some Zimbabweans in the house. All right. And I was watching the news and it was talking about Mugabe and about how they've sat him down and he's under house arrest and blah, blah, blah. And there's some sort of coup going on or whatever's going on. And then it showed a load of people jumping up and down saying, we love Mugabe. And I was like, oh, what is that? You got a load of people saying we hate Mugabe and a load of people saying we love Mugabe. And my wife said to me, why? Well, I don't understand. He's a murderer, he's a killer, he's this, he's that. According to what the world's opinion, right? He's a monster. Why do they love him? I said, because, probably because he's blessed them somehow. And most people in the world, if you want to get them to do what it is you want them to do, give them something that is going to satisfy their immediate need. Are you with me? Give them the offer of unlimited benefits, free college, free university education, NHS that is paid for by the government. Give them something that is going to, you know, that's not necessarily wrong, but is going to meet their immediate need. Imagine I could say to you, I can guarantee that you can eat as much as you like and you never put on a pound. Everyone will be following me. Come to this church, you'll never gain weight. Everyone will be like, yeah, we need to go to that church. Huh? Are you with me? Huh? Because sometimes we want what's just for our pleasure. And then what we do is we play now. But how many of you know you've got to pay later? It's like buying everything on credit. It feels good when you've got that unlimited credit card in your hand and you can go out on this mad little spending spree. And it all feels good while you're trying on the clothes and you're walking about with all the bags, you know what I mean? But it don't feel too good when the letter comes through the mail saying you owe 3,000 pounds and we're gonna be taking this off you and that off you. But a lot of people wanna play now but you have to pay later. It's a big thing. What are your goals? What are your aims? Another question for you is how much of what you would consider our failure, your failure or problems in life can be traced back to these 40 goals or, or desires. If we're really honest and we look at some of the failures and the problems that we have in lives and the outcomes and the consequences, if you follow it back, how many of you know that we can, we can point at some bad decision we made? Hello? Am I right or wrong? Wave your hand at me if you know I'm right. Huh? It's probably all of them. So we have to understand that outcomes are very important and they're inevitable for all of us. All of us are gonna have outcomes. There are gonna be results, there are gonna be consequences, there is a payday when you have to pay coming up at some, some time in the future. Better to have saved than to have overspent when it comes time for that bill to come in. So number two, what areas of our lives? There are many areas of our lives where the results or consequences of our actions are causing challenges. I wanna look at three real quick. Relationships, prosperity and ministry. Because these are three in the church that, that people struggle with the most. Relationships are very key. These include towards God, towards other people, but also towards ourselves. Because I mean, we know sometimes our, our relationship with God can struggle based upon something that's happened in our past. Maybe your father abandoned you and you never think that you can trust God fully. Maybe something happened earlier on, maybe a husband abused you, you think you, you put that on a God. You know, you have a, a relationship with God where you believe in Him, that He is God, but maybe something's got in to stop you believing fully that He's good. Because you have to believe He's good, not just that He's God. Because otherwise, you're just gonna be a, a, a half-hearted, in and out sort of person. But God is good. He's a good Father. He don't give you bad stuff. He's good. If you ask Him for bread, He ain't gonna give you a stone. Are you with me? If you ask Him for a fish, He ain't gonna give you a snake. He's a good God. If you ask Him for help, He's gonna help you. He's a good God. Huh? 
And then what about relationships with other people? Lack of trust, someone's broke trust, you never trust anyone again. That means that you're withered up as a person because relationships are based on trust and you have to give trust. See me and my wife, we have this thing where we give people trust and we'll give you trust until you break it. Then we'll have to put some measures in place. We give trust to our children. Yeah, well, you can go on the bus. Yeah, you can have a phone. Yeah, you can do this, you can do that. Yeah, you can go shopping with your friends. And we will give you trust until you break it. When you break it, then there's some special measures being put in place. Are you with me? And then we'll have to work that out. But relationships towards God, towards other people. And then what about the relationship you have yourself? Huh? How many of you have ever said to yourself, I hate myself? Huh? I hate myself. I hate the way I look. I hate the fact that I have this. I hate the shape of my body. I hate the fact that my eyes are too close together. My ears are too big. My nose is too big. I hate the shape of my chin. I hate the fact that I've got no hair. I hate the fact that I've got curly hair. I hate the fact I've got straight hair. I hate the fact I've got ginger hair. I hate myself. That's a relationship you're having with yourself. Huh? The problem with this is that everything rises and falls on relationships. Everything. Relationships are everything. Huh? And if you struggle in relationships, you're struggling in life. Because everything rises and falls on relationships. God is a relationship. Father, Son and Spirit are all together. They call it the Trinity. And, and, and you know, Muslims and different, different faith groups sometimes can't get their heads around it. Even Christians can't get their head around it. How can you have three gods but one God? Because everyone's into this adding situation. You know, one plus one plus one equals three. But the thing is, in a good relationship, in a godly relationship, in the relationship of God, it's not about one adds to another because they're all complete. It's not one adds to the other. It's not the Son adds to the Father and the Spirit adds to the Son and the Father. It's not about adding anything. It's about enhancing. It's about multiplication. It's about they multiply each other's effectiveness. It's about they back each other up. It's about they get behind each other. Huh? They multiply each other. Then you get one times one times one equals one. Three ones equal one. Huh? Because they multiply each other. That's why when you get married to someone who is the right person for you and you're both together in that relationship, it's not two halves leaning together to make a whole relationship. I need them to complete me. If you ever need, a, need a, 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 someone of the opposite sex to complete you, then guess what? You'll find that all they'll ever do is just finish you off. <laughs> they ain't gonna complete you, man, but they will definitely finish you off. Huh? But it says two become one, right? Two ones times each other. We're not adding to each other. We're multiplying each other's effectiveness in life and we become one, relationships. Christianity is a relationship. It's all about relationship. It's not about what you know, it's about who you know. You can know all of the scriptures. You can know everything, but so does Satan. He knows the scriptures better than you. He knows the Bible better than you, but he ain't saved because he's not in right relationship with the Saviour. It's about who you know, it's about relationship. I mean, if you're not in work, you can be the best person for the job, but if such and such is their golf buddy. Hello. But if your boss is a Tottenham supporter and you're an Arsenal supporter, it might be that another Tottenham supporter gets the job. Because that's just how it works. Are you with me? It's about who you know. How many of you have ever come up against a who you know situation? Huh? Isn't it great when you know someone that's gonna help you out? And it's great when you have a connection with someone that's gonna enable you to get to where it is that you wanna to get to. Huh? Hallelujah. When your friend is the doctor, when your friend is the dentist, when your friend is the parking attendant overseer. <laughs> huh? Who you know? Life comes through relationships. Then there's prosperity. Man, this is something that people haven't got a clue about. 
Prosperity is something that Jesus wants us to have whenever possible. You know that? He wants you to prosper whenever possible. There's nothing holy in being poor. Just because you're poor don't mean that you're more holy. It might mean that your bank account is more holy because it's got holes in it. You put money in and money just leaks out. You don't know where it goes. You might have a pocket with holes in. Hello? Huh? Your heart might be full of holes. There might be leakage in your life. But it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. It matters about the motives of your heart. It matters about where your focus is. It matters about where your devotion is. You can't serve God and money, the Bible says, or mammon, materialism. Serve God. Huh? There's nothing particularly extra holy about prosperity. But then prosperity should never be an end or an outcome in itself. God's not going to make you wealthy or prosperous just so that you can say that you're wealthy and prosperous or you can feel comfortable and you can have more money than the next person. That's not why he does it. There has to be a purpose. So you have to understand what is my outcome in this? What do I want to be? Prosperity doesn't just mean being rich. Some people want to be rich. They want to win the lottery. They pray when they buy their lottery ticket. God, I have faith in you that you will give me money for nothing. But the statistics prove that people that get something for nothing very rarely keep it. Huh? Because they don't value it. How many of you have ever given something to your kids as a present? Christmas is coming. Hello. And the thing that they want, that you labour hard to buy, sacrifice hard to buy, they play with on that day and then it goes in the cupboard. That drone that never flies, that radio controlled car that only ever goes when you're playing with it secretly. <laughs> Why? Because they don't value it, man. But if they've worked for it, they're gonna, they're gonna look after it. I mean, if you know what I'm talking about. The things that someone gives you for nothing, you don't always value as much as the things that you've had to sweat hard for. Am I right or wrong? Huh? Prosperity is not just about being rich. Prosperity is about having more than you need. That's all it is. Huh? If you owe two pound and you've got three pound, you're prosperous. It's very simple, isn't it? Amen. And don't that affect the way you think? When you think you're poor down and out, you're going to be, woe is me, poor me, poor me. I can never do this. I can never do that. You limit yourself. But when you understand how prosperous you truly are, you know, 95% of the world's population have no money at all. None. If you have a, how many of you have got at least a pound somewhere? Come on now. Let me see your hands. You've got a pound somewhere. It's in your car, it's in your pocket, it's in a bank account somewhere. That means you're in the world's top 5% of prosperous people. Top five you are prosperous. Because some people got no running water, they've got no electricity, they've got no house, they've got no income. Are you with me? Heavy. Prosperity, man. It means having a little bit more than we need in both quality and quantity. John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, The thief does not kill except, come except to steal and kill and destroy. He said, But I have come that you should have life and have it more abundantly. God wants us to be prosperous. But you know what? Some people take it to a funky extreme and they make it all about prosperity. And therefore, you know, there are different streams in the kingdom of God and in the Bible. There's streams, little eddies in the river of life that God gives to us, right? Healing, health, prosperity, wholeness, all these different things, right? Relationships, blah, blah, blah. And they're cool when they're part of the, 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 the holistic river of God. But when you take one stream too far, it becomes an extreme. And some people have taken prosperity too far. You know, they name it, claim it, pray for it, call money out of heaven and all that stuff. You're an idiot to do that. It's wrong to do that. It's not right to do that. It's an extreme. People look at you from outside of the church and say, you're just a greedy Christian idiot. Are you with me? Don't do that. Because the outcome of that is that if you're not rich, then you're not holy. 
you got no faith. What about health and healing? Well, if you're sick, that means that surely you're not in God's will. You know, when my wife got cancer, we had a pastor come to us who's into all that and say, you know what? It might be that you're sick because you've got sin in your life. Because if you were holy and if you were right with God, then you wouldn't be sick. Some people think like that. Huh? After he picked his teeth up with broken fingers, <laughs> he didn't. But my wife said to him, do you believe in prosperity as well? He said, yeah. She said, do you believe that if people are in debt, then they're not holy? He went, yeah. He said, well, how comes you're in debt then? Have you got hidden sin in your life? It works both ways, man. It's not about that. It's ridiculous. And then there's the other thing where this is the biggest trap. Are you ready for this? Where people, Christians, but people, in, people that are outside of, of God's uh, grace, but also people inside God's grace, they think we have a misconception that you have to take care of all of your earthly needs and Jesus has to take care of all your spiritual needs. Right? And so people go to work and they work hard and there's nothing wrong with working hard. But they go to work and I have to do this and I have to do that and I have to do this and I have to take care of myself. I have to take care of my needs. And Jesus, you have to take care of the spiritual stuff. But you know, it's the wrong way around. So I'll prove it to you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus says to his people, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. In other words, take care of your spiritual stuff, you. You take care of the spiritual stuff. You pray, you read, you fast, you live right, you obey, you do all that. He says, and then I'll give you everything you need. But we want to get everything we need and then let God take care of the spiritual stuff. But that's not what he says. He says, you take care of your spiritual stuff and I'll make sure you've got everything that's going to enable you to do that. <laughs> and that mind boggle. Does that change someone's mind? Huh? See, you have to have, many have the idea that God should take care of their spiritual need, they should take care of their natural needs, but it's the opposite way round. Then ministry. There's a lot of misconceptions about this word. People speak about ministry and they think it's some special thing that people do in church, like pastors. People want ministry and they think that people in ministry are special in some way, but it, it, it really speaks of our life of service to God. That's all it is, ministry. Two, two main words in the New Testament translation, diakono and doulos. And they both speak of a servant, someone that sweeps the floors, someone that was in the house, taking care of the, 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 the washing up, the, you know, cleaning around the rooms. Ministers are servants. It's our life of service. So technically, every Christian is a minister. And our whole life should be considered as ministry. All of it. Not... Not just the bit that we, we do when we come to church, but the bit I do when I go home is, is my business. And the bit I do when I go to work is, is my business. No, if you're a Christian, your whole life is ministry. That's it. It means that you serve God in everything that you do, everywhere that you go, in whatever capacity that you can. And I'm not talking about go to work and start becoming the evangelist in the office and you know, you sinners repent, you'd get sacked. But live right. Don't, don't nick the pen. Are you with me? Love people. Speak well of people. You know, don't be cursing and swearing and screaming and doing all that stuff. And then, and then tell people that you're a Christian, you go to church. They're going to look at you like you are a double-minded hypocrite. Serve God everywhere you go. You, everyone's a minister. Huh? There are some that equip others, then there are others that put into practice what they've learned. But all of us are ministers in some fashion and should be involved in ministry. That's what it says in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 and 12. In the New King James Version, it says it like this. Jesus, he himself, Jesus, this is what's called the gifts of the Son. Jesus gave some, some, not all, some, to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. 
Now, the Living Translation, it says it a little bit different. It says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So everyone's at work. It's just different people have different roles. Have you got that? And in all these things, we have outcomes, results and consequences of decisions that we've made. Huh? So number three, are we, are we clear about outcomes and how they work in our lives? Is everyone clear? How many of you have got a few outcomes in your life that you'd like to change? Huh? Maybe you'd like to change your job, your house situation. Maybe you'd like to change your income. Come on now. How many of you would like to have more money? Bigger house? Huh? Slimmer waistline? More hair, whiter teeth? Straighter nose? Huh? A partner that loves you? Hello. We're not going to talk about that. But there are some simple changes that can be made to transform the outcomes you're currently facing. I mean, if you've heard this statement, you, get, you can't get something for nothing. Right? You can't get, you're suspicious, aren't you? If I brought a gold coin to you right now, a big gold coin, and I said, look, it's a big gold coin, you can have it for a pound, you'd look at me and you'd go, nah, it's fake. No way. There's no way. I'm not having that, I'm not buying that. Yeah, you're trying to have me over, right? Because we have this mindset that you can't get something for nothing. Are you with me? And we live with that mindset. You can't get something for nothing. And in most things, it's true. Although in the act of salvation, you actually get something for nothing. Because you give nothing to Jesus and you get everything in return. By grace through faith. you just got to believe that Jesus Christ is the saviour of the world. That you're a sinner and if you die without him, you're going to go to hell. And that's just it. You lived without Christ on earth, you're going to go and be without God in eternity. You're going to be in darkness. And darkness is not the opposite of light. Darkness is the absence of light. It's where God is not. You chose that on earth. You lived your life like that. You didn't believe in him. You didn't follow him. So that's your outcome. That's where you're going to end up for eternity. Or the opposite is true, that if you believed in Christ on earth, if you received him as your Lord and Saviour, if you followed him the best that you could, through him you gain access to God who is light, who is love, who is life, and you're going to have that for eternity. I don't know about you, but I don't know why people don't get saved. It's such a good deal, man. You actually, it's the one thing that is really good that you get for nothing. You don't give anything for it, except your sin, your darkness, your evil thoughts, your, 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 your madness, your mess. And in return, you know, you give him all your wrongs, you get all his rights. Woo, what a deal, man. That's why the Bible says that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Because you've got to be a fool to give up that, you know what I mean, and not take that deal. But some things, you, 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 most things you can't get for nothing. But, watch this. If this is true, that you can't get something for nothing, huh? it must also be true that you can't give anything without getting something for it. It's the opposite. Are you with me? Here we're getting into, into the, the, the little change now. Are you ready for this? Are you still with me? So the key to changing your outcomes is your input. You want to change your outcome, you have to change your investment. You want to get something different out, you've got to put something different in. Am I right or wrong? Huh? The act of giving or making an investment is crucial to you enjoying a satisfactory outcome. How many of you have never earned a penny in your life and gone to a bank and tried to draw money out of the, the hole in the wall? Huh? There's nothing there. There are three areas of giving. Time, talent and treasure. But you have to understand that these things are not interchangeable. Right? These are three areas that everyone gives. Time, talent, and treasure. Amen? But you have to understand that these areas are not interchangeable. What do I mean by that? Well, a lot of people think that, let's use the church as an example. A lot of, a lot of people think if I turn up and get involved, then God's going to bless my finances. No. If you give your time, then you receive back from it time. 
Or they say, well, I'm going to use my talent, like Winston here is going to use his talent to play the keyboard because he's talented as a musician. But just because he's using his talent doesn't mean to say that he's going to get a financial windfall from that. Huh? What he'll get is someone else's talent being invested in him later on down the line. When you give money, guess what you get back? Money. Huh? These things are not interchangeable. But some people want a different outcome from what they invested or put in. But that's not how it works. Are you with me? Understand how it works. Then you make the investment that's going to give you an outcome. Watch this. I'm going to give you some keys to help transform our outcomes. Play something a little bit lighter because I feel like I'm about to deliver a funeral service. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. to celebrate the passing of your old outcome. Today, in the presence of friends and family, we will lay to rest those old mistakes, those old ways, those old things that you have done that you wish you hadn't have done. Today they go down into the grave, never to rise again. So here, dearly beloved, I'm gonna give you five keys to take with you in memorial. Key number one. Key number one. Create your goal. Create your goal. Create the outcome that you want to enjoy. Identify where you want to get to. Where you want to become what you want to get, what you want to receive. Number one, create the goal. Be specific. And then you'll, you'll be starting with the end in mind. It's like, I sit in my car, I want to go somewhere, I put in the destination I want to get to in the sat -nav. Then I'm starting with the end in mind. Are you with me? I'm actually aiming at something. Problem most people miss where they want to get to because they don't know where to aim. Set the target. Are you with me? Number two, focus on what you can do or do have to invest in it. This is a problem that people sometimes get into. They fall into a negative poor me mentality. Well, I haven't got this and I haven't got that. And I, well, forget what you haven't got. You can't invest what you don't have. The problem is that most people have an unsatisfactory, unfulfilled outcome because they're always investing what they don't have into getting somewhere that they want to get to. What do you have? What have you got? What skills, what talents, what abilities, what money, what this, what that, what have you got? Invest that. Are you with me? Focus on what you have. Look at what you have and give that. Number three, set your timeline milestones. Huh? In other words, by this time, I wanna have this, be here, be doing that, right? You set it down and then you make sure you break the thing down into achievable blocks. You know why people don't get to where they wanna get to? It's because they set the timeline and then it's like putting something in the sat nav and then getting no instructions. You know, you put a destination in the sat nav and it will say, go 100 yards, turn right. That's a milestone. Once you make it to the 100 yards and have turned right, then you're going to get another instruction. Then you set another milestone. Go 500 yards straight ahead until you get to the roundabout and then take the second exit off the roundabout. That's another milestone. And you keep getting all of these milestones that are measurable. This is called eating the elephant. The problem is you, you set a goal and you never think you're going to get there or it takes a little bit longer than you thought and you quit. It's like you look at the elephant, you want to eat the elephant. How do you eat the elephant? One bite at a time and always start at a trunk. It's softer and then it won't complain as much. Huh? It's like 
So what did the elephant say to the lion that bit his trunk? What did you do that for? I'll give you an example. Right? A, a, a goal without these milestones is I want to get fit. I want to get fit. That's a goal without any milestones. Are you with me? And then you go to the gym a couple of times and then you're not getting fit and so you quit. But putting timeline milestones in is I'll go to the gym two times a week. And then all you've got to concentrate on is two times a week. Are you with me? And then 52 weeks later, you've been 700 and You've been 100 times. I was doing my calculations because I do twice a day. Listen, you don't look like this by twice a week, let me tell you. Huh? Well, you want to write a book? So write one chapter a week. That's your timeline. Then next week, you write another chapter. Next week, you've gone to the gym twice and you mark it off. Do you see what I mean? Eating the elephant. Huh? Or I'll save X amount this month. Then by, I've done that this year. You know what? I've got, I've got money for Christmas. Hallelujah. I can buy my kids whatever they want. Well, I have a daughter, not exactly everything they want. Hello. Huh? I'd need to be Bill Gates. But you understand what I mean? You want to save, you want to get a car, you want to get a house, just put away this amount. I'm going to put away this amount this month because in a year from now, you'd wish you'd have started today. So set your timeline milestones. Huh? Number four, we're nearly there. Identify the support you'll need. Identify the support you'll need. The fact is you can't do it all alone. Huh? I couldn't get off drugs alone. I needed people around me to help me out. That's why I came into the Victory Outreach home. And now 22 years later, I'm drug free, heroin free, crack free, methadone free, alcohol free, cigarette free. I'm not in jail. But I had Tommy around me and Art Blahos and different people around me and Ron was there, Pastor Ron and different people. And we were there together. Identify the support you need and be proactive and get around the people that can help you through your process. See, it's rare that people are magically gonna be able to read your mind. You know how many people say, well, no one cares about me. No one knows about you. It's not that they don't care, they just don't know. You walk around, you know, with a face like a smack bum, expecting everyone to go, oh, I detect that there is a need there that I can help with. Are you with me? Huh? Stop that. Be proactive. Huh? You have to learn to ask and maybe wait until they've got a bit of time. But get around the right people. This is where your investment of time, talent and treasure also pays off. Because if you've invested time in God's kingdom, someone else is going to invest time in your life. If you've invested your talent in God's kingdom, then someone else is going to invest their talent in your life. Number five, keep everything lined up with God's will. Huh? Keep everything lined up with God's will. Don't just do what you want, but do what God wants. Then you can ask Him for anything and He's going to bless you because it's all in line with His will. You take care of your spiritual life. He'll take care of your needs, your food, your drink, your clothing. He'll bring the right people around you. You're living holy. He's going to put the right partner in your life. You're living right with God. And it's not because of any magic, but it is magnetic. When you are walking in the will of God, you become magnetic to good things. You become a target for evil things, but you become magnetic to good things. Just because you're a target, don't mean to say that that arrow is gonna hit. Because you have a shield of faith. Your wings are like a shield of steel. You have armour on. You have other people watching out for you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Huh? but you become magnetic to good things. Are you with me? I'm not a rich man, but I, I dress good. I look good. I drive a nice car, I own a house. It's not massive, it's not huge, it's not a mansion, 
I'm not walking about covered in gold, but I'm magnetic to blessing. I get good people around me. I find myself in situations. The other day, I just went to meet a friend for coffee. I ended up having lunch with a guy called Louis Palau, one of the top evangelists ever in the world. He's led millions of people to Christ. And I'm sitting there having lunch with him, talking, it's like we were pals. I'm sitting there thinking, I'm talking to him, having a laugh and that, thinking, what am I doing here? How did I get here with this dude? He's just about to speak at a big conference. I'm sitting there having a cheeky bit of lunch with him. Huh? Get lined up with God's will. Because if it's God's will, it's God's bill. He's going to pay the, he's already paid the price. The most you ever have to do is leave a tip. Huh? Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37 says this, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? The best outcome is where you're in God's perfect will, seeing what He wanted for you to become, actually becoming a reality. And then the outcomes and the consequences of your lives will overflow with such abundant goodness that it's going to bless not only you, but it's going to bless others around you as well. There you go, Paul Lloyd transforming your outcomes. How amazing was that? I hope you're as encouraged by that as I am. I love that guy and I love his ministry and I love what he's just shared. Let's put it into practice. And if you were encouraged, please tell your friends about it through social media. Please subscribe so we can send you notifications for every time we're pushing out one of these amazing talks for Made in Manchester. Let's do it. We hope that you enjoyed the show. Make sure you don't miss out on what's coming up on Message Live. All you need to do is like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and click the bell to receive notifications and the latest news of Message Live.